Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Dee Logan. I'm a project associate uh, at the Transitions to Adulthood Center for Research, as well as SPARC. Uh, we're so glad you could join us today for our webinar, The College Years, How Students with Lived Experience Navigate Academic and Mental Health Management with Amanda Costa, Ann Lane, and Laura Golden. Um, I'm just going to go over a couple housekeeping items before I turn it over to our presenters. Uh, next slide. So just note that this broadcast is being recorded and it will be available for viewing soon on the Transitions to Adulthood Centers for Research's website. The video recording as well as the slides will be available. Uh, if you're just joining, the slides are handouts in your GoToWebinar tab uh, of your, uh, the handouts tab of your GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, if you have any electronic handheld devices, we recommend you move them away from your computer and speakers. We recommend closing any file sharing applications or streaming music or videos that you may have uh, going on. Uh, if you're using the phone, please call in using your unique audio pin. Uh, if you are experiencing any audio problems, you can check your settings in the GoToWebinar's audio tab of the control panel. If you're having any technical difficulties, you can email me at deirdre.logan at umassmed.edu, or you can use the questions tab within the GoToWebinar control panel. We will be having a Q&A session after the presentation. If you have questions for the presenters, you can send them in any time by typing them into the questions tab as well into the GoToWebinar uh, control panel. Uh, next slide. So these are our funders. As you can see, the um, Transitions to Adulthood uh, Centers for Research also has a uh, our RTC grant from Nidler and SAMHSA. And you can visit our website at www.umassmed.edu backslash transitions ACR. And with all of that out of the way, I'm going to turn it over to Laura. Thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction, Dee. Amanda, Ian, and I are really excited to share some of our work with you today. Um, and we want to start off just by giving an overview of what we call PASS. PASS is a peer academic coaching model we developed um, in order to support college students' mental health conditions. And PASS is an acronym that stands for Peer Academic Supports for Success. Firstly, we just wanted to acknowledge uh, the, the huge concern that is mental health on college campuses. About one-third of undergrads have, a clinically, have clinically significant symptoms of mental health problems such as depression or anxiety. So that's a sizable chunk of the college population that uh, are, are dealing with mental health concerns. Um, we do know that college students with mental health concerns and mental health conditions have a very high dropout rate. They actually drop out at one of the highest rates of any disability group. And we know that positive mental health is strongly correlated to lots of good stuff in adult life. Um, success, of course, academically in college and also in the workforce after college and being a resilient adult. So as much as we can, we want to support young adults who are struggling with their mental health to try to attain positive mental health during their college years. So in order to combat all of those difficulties, like I said, we've been developing the PATH program, an empirically supported peer coach intervention to help students with mental health conditions succeed academically. PATH is a four-phase project. Um, our first phase, we spoke with some key stakeholders who are uh, involved with college mental health and asked for their insight. Phase two, um, we took all of the information we gathered, all of the research out there, and put pen to paper and kind of specified the path model. We developed a peer coaching manual outlining the activities we think peer coaching should entail and what the peer coach student relationship should look like. We also developed a fidelity model saying how do you implement this new design correctly? 
And from there, we moved on to phase three, where we did a small feasibility pilot of this new model we developed with about a dozen students on the Boston University campus. And we said, okay, we've developed this new model that we think is a good fit for college students' needs in terms of mental health. Let's try it out, see how it works, see any tweaks we need to make, um, and just kind of get, get the ball rolling in that sense. And currently we're in our final phase, phase four, where we're doing a pilot randomized control trial, um, again on Boston University campus. And we, are, uh, we have two groups of students. One group is receiving peer academic coaching, and uh, we have another control group that is receiving services as usual on the Boston University campus. And we just wanna try out that type of structure to prepare us to test um, the effects of participating in PATH compared to, compared to just receiving regular campus services. So we just wanted to go into a little bit more detail about our findings from phase one, which was the qualitative interviews we did. Um, they were very insightful and really informed our PATH model. So these were all qualitative interviews, about a half, uh, sorry, an hour long. Um, and we did them with a group of four key populations on college campuses, one being college students with mental health conditions themselves. We really wanted to hear from these young people their personal accounts and experiences um, managing their mental health on campus. We also spoke with faculty who had experience uh, having students with mental health conditions enrolled in their courses and supporting them. Uh, and we also spoke to counseling center staff and disability center staff who had experience supporting students with mental health conditions as well. And as far as the content of the interviews, they covered uh, experiences being or working with young adults with mental health conditions and what they felt the challenges were to academic success and also the facilitators, what really helped uh, college students with mental health conditions succeed as well. Um, so in terms of demographics of these folks we talked to, unfortunately not super diverse, um, primarily female and primarily white. For college students, we can see um, that actually 50% had transferred um, from their current un from their from prior university to their current university. So that's a very high uh, transfer rate and a very transient population. And 75% were currently enrolled in outpatient therapy. Um, for faculty, it's interesting to note the depth of their experience in their current positions. 57% had been in their in, been in academia for over 20 years, and none had been in academia for under 10 years. So really experienced folks in terms of faculty. It's a little bit of a different story in terms of disability services staff and counseling center staff. Uh, for disability services, we can see that two thirds were in their current position for two years or less. So that's, that's not a long time at all. And then for counseling center staff, 75% were in their current position for five years or less. So that indicates maybe a high turnover rate and certainly not a high level of experience in those offices. And I realized I forgot to mention, in terms of the campuses we conducted these interviews on, uh, the Boston University campus, the University of Massachusetts Boston campus, and Wright State University, which is a large public university in Ohio. So walking away from those interviews, we had, during the interviews, we auto-recorded them, and walking away from the interviews, we had them transcribed. Um, and from the transcriptions, we began a qualitative coding process. At first, as a team, we sat down together and we came up with some preliminary themes that we saw popping out of the transcripts. From there, we got more concrete and identified specific codes, and we turned that into a, a coding manual that we could refer to with highly specified codes. Um, and as a team, we had three staff coding with deduce coding software, um, and we did iterator reliability tests to make sure we were um, coding the same excerpts as the same codes and that we were all interpreta interpreting the data in similar ways to make sure there was consistency in our analysis. And we did end up with an inter-rater reliability at 80% or higher for all of our coding. 
So we had a few key findings that we wanted to share with you walking away from these qualitative interviews and our coding of them. The first is that although every student is unique, and of course even if two students have the same diagnosis, the way they experience that diagnosis can vary greatly. Um, there are still some commonly faced challenges that we saw pop up among a large number of the students we talked to, and those included anxiety, stress coping skills, time management, and chronic absenteeism. And we have a quote here from a student that we felt was really exemplified these challenges. The student talked about, they said, my art class recently, they went to the art museum, and I just like was not into it. Like I just get anxiety, just getting lost. I've never been there. I don't have any friends to meet up with in that class. I didn't even go. I was like, I cannot do this. So definitely some anxiety there and potentially um, some lacking stress coping skills, which led to absenteeism. Um, and for faculty who do want to support students who are struggling with some of these challenges related to their mental health, um, the opinion on what the best way to do that varies a lot. Um, some faculty have a very stringent and inflexible approach to student support. Um, on the left, we can see one faculty told us, unless it's documented, I'm all about equity. If you get one more day, everybody gets one more day, and sentiments along those lines, so pretty strict. And then on the, the right-hand side, we have a faculty quote uh, who was more flexible in, in his approach to supporting students. He said, like I said, I've not had students who are trying to get out of work. They're just not, they just need help getting it done, you know. So a term that came up a lot was hand-holding and faculty's uh, perception of whether they were hand-holding or not and what, what level was appropriate. That's something that weighed heavily on faculty's minds and the interpretation of that really varied. And for those faculty that are trying to actively help students with mental health conditions succeed, um, a lot of times keeping informed with how students were doing and whether students were accessing services was difficult, particularly because there are specific confidentiality laws on college campuses that protect um, students from having their information shared, such as HIPAA laws and FERPA laws. Um, so if that was an obstacle for some faculty and sometimes faculty were frustrated with the, the lack of information that could be shared with them, and also not always educated about these laws and what they mean in terms of what can be shared and what can't. Um, so one faculty said, I know that there is a lot of confidentiality issues, but just, to, you know, but just to know that the student is showing up on an ongoing basis, I don't even know if that's allowed to be divulged, but just to know that so-and-so has contacted us. So this faculty really wanted to know if the student was receiving services, um, but they just they can't be informed of that unless the student decides to directly share that with them, um, and that, that created some frustration. <clears throat> if students are referred to services, however, um, they're not always going to access them. In general, we found that students are hesitant, hesitant to access services and also to get accommodations through the Office of Disability Services. Um, there are a few key, key reasons that this seemed to happen. Firstly, discrimination or stigma. Students worry about, if I get accommodations, what does that mean about me as a student? What will other students think of me if they are able to witness these accommodations? And probably just the ownership of the identity of being an individual with a mental health condition. Um, that's something that a lot of young people struggle with, especially if their diagnosis is newer to them. Also, um, accessing services and getting accommodations is a pretty bureaucratic process, and there's a lot of paperwork involved. Um, so that can be pretty overwhelming, especially for a young person assuming adult responsibilities and kind of accessing services independently for the first time. And also, if your mental health is not in the best of shape, um, that can be a very strenuous and energy-consuming activity to try to get all your paperwork together and get it to the appropriate person. So we found overwhelmingly that students prefer to get informal accommodations 
when seeking accommodations. So informal accommodations are more making one-on-one -on -one connections with faculty and working with faculty about your situation and having unwritten informal understandings, um, whereas formal accommodations you have to go through the Office of Disability Services, and again, there's lots of paperwork. So students definitely prefer that one-off, approaching their professor, saying, hi, I'm having a difficult time, going into as much detail as they feel comfortable, and requesting some sort of accommodation, maybe extra time on a paper or something else of that nature. Um, that was a definite striking finding we came across, is that preference for informal accommodation. And we can see in the speech bubble on the left, faculty acknowledged how hard it was to get formal accommodations and were sensitive to that fact. Um, the faculty said, I think it can be difficult. And I think for a student that is already having mental health issues or, you know, is reticent around disclosing because of concerns around stigma or whatever, I think the university probably could find a way to be more welcoming, to be less bureaucratic. So there's an understanding of this barrier that students face. For those students that do put themselves out there and reach out for services and make that leap, um, they often realize pretty quickly that these services are pretty under-resourced. Um, that goes for both offices of disability services and counseling centers. Um, a lot of times with counseling centers, there's a wait list that causes a student to wait for weeks, if not months, to get their initial appointment. Even in crisis situations, it can be several days before they're able to get in the door, which is alarming. Um, and also, once they do get in the door and start to receive services, a lot of times there's a time limit or a session limit on how long they can continue to receive these services. Um, so that, that can be frustrating as well. So just the capacity of these services is pretty limited, and students are aware of that. One student who was starting to receive um, counseling services said, I mean, first of all, if the initial appointment you make with someone is like, I'm sorry, but like after this, I really don't think I can see you after, you know, like two months. Like that would be helpful if they could just be there for a prolonged period of time. So the student really wanted ongoing mental health care on campus. That was desirable to them, but it just wasn't a possibility for them because they recognized that the counseling center just didn't have the capacity to do that. And as far as staff in the Office of Disability Services and counseling centers, they're not denying the reality that students are pointing out. They're in agreement, and they say, we know it's a problem. Um, one ODS staff, so that's Office of Disability Services staff, noted we haven't promoted service services because if we did, you know, I already have a waiting list of 17 to 20 people. So it's just, it would be too much to promote it. So that's kind of striking because we would hope uh, disability services would be uh, advertised to all students who could possibly benefit from it, but they're even hesitant to put the word out just because they're so overwhelmed. Um, and for counseling centers, similar situation, they have a wait list that runs for months at a time. Um, and this counseling center staff in this quotation said that this lack of ability, they said, I think that then undermines people's abilities to be able to have the energy to focus on academic work. So there's an acknowledgement that they know that their lack of adequate capacity directly correlates to students' academic success and their well-being on campus. So, yeah, they're not denying that this resource shortage and that they're really at capacity or beyond their capacity. So just to summarize our main takeaways from these phase one qualitative interviews, that definitely greatly informed our path model and what we wanted to um, address in terms of this intervention. Uh, in terms of college students with mental health conditions, we learned definitely that they struggle to navigate the academic demands of college that they aren't often accessing on-campus services. And if they are, they're quickly learning that uh, these services often lack the resources to meet their needs. In terms of faculty and staff, we learned they have mixed beliefs on appropriate levels of support. So that kind of hand-holding concept and their struggle with what's appropriate and what's not is definitely very much on faculty members' minds. Um, and again, there isn't a lot of open communication on campus between faculty 
and different support services, such as counseling services or offices, offices of disability services. Um, and that, that occurs because of confidentiality laws, uh, but that can be a point of frustration for faculty. And also just acknowledging that staff and faculty also know that services are under-resourced and they're not trying to hide that they're in agreement with students and that these shortages impact their ability to support students effectively. So with that, I want to turn it over to Ian to tell you more about the past model that we created as a result of these interviews and some other background information we collected. Thanks, Laura. <clears throat> now I'd like to turn our attention to the PASS model itself and give you a brief overview of some important aspects of the program. The inspiration for the PASS model came from two primary sources. First, from our analyses of the Phase I qualitative data, and second, from two other college coaching models, namely the Wright State University Raiders on the Autism Spectrum Program, or RAISE, and BU's college coaching model for students with mental health conditions. The PASS program differs from these other two programs in some important ways, however. Firstly, whereas Wright State's program was specifically designed for students on the autism spectrum, PASS was designed for students with mental health conditions, such as anxiety, depression, schizophrenia, and others. Boston University's program was also designed for students with mental health conditions, like PASS, but is implemented by professionals. PASS, on the other hand, is implemented not by clinicians, but by other students. These students are coaches who are upperclassmen at Boston University with a good academic track record who have been thriving on campus. These coaches may or may not have their own lived experience with a mental health condition. The participants receiving coaching are other undergraduate students at Boston University who have a self-identified mental health condition which has impaired their academic success. Each coaching session will occur one time per week in person and will run for an average of one or two hours at a time, which can sometimes be a little bit more, but the maximum session time tends to be around four hours. Every coaching session will follow a concrete template which will act as a guide for the coaches beginning with rapport building and concluding with final thoughts or concerns, as shown here. Rapport building sounds formal, but really just consists of building a relationship that's based on trust and empathy. PASS is designed to be a down-to-earth guide for students and coaches so that each part of the agenda can be made more concrete and easily understood. So, for instance, during logistics and housekeeping, coaches and students may discuss some of the things that are going on in the student's world and this usually evolves naturally into a discussion of one salient topic. This discussion represents agenda item number three and is where themes are uncovered and details are teased apart and the heart of their problem may emerge. Then, during agenda item number four, an action activity is discussed, which is a proactive, implementable step that the student can take now to help ensure some progress is made. As a concrete example, Suppose during housekeeping, the issue of needing an accommodation for test taking comes up and is teased apart in their discussion. The coach and student may work together during the action activity to craft an email to the Office of Disability Services to help them receive such an accommodation. And finally, the action step is followed by a review of things discussed for the following week and upcoming session and then closes with any other concerns the student may have. The core competencies of the PASS model are encapsulated by the acronym STEER, which stands for Structure, Technology, Emotional Agility, Advocacy, and Resiliency. Structure refers to structuring one's time and efforts according to an academic goal in an attempt to better plan, organize, and prioritize tasks. An example of such activities could be making a to-do list or calendaring together. The use of technology to augment one's education can be very helpful for struggling students, and students and coaches can work together to determine if an app may be helpful, for example, for them to better organize and complete certain tasks. Thousands of such apps now exist today. Emotional agility, or put another way, emotional flexibility, 
is essentially one's capacity to face negative thoughts and feelings courageously with compassion and an open mind to learn how to acknowledge their feelings without judgment. Advocacy is the ability to recognize when you might be struggling and how to advocate for the receipt of some kind of reasonable accommodation and to be able to navigate this with the coach and professors alike. And finally, resiliency refers to someone's capacity to adapt to and bounce back from stress and adversity. We wanted to make things very concrete for coaches and so developed a peer coach manual, as Laura touched on earlier, which includes detailed information on supported education and provides the coaches with valuable insights into important techniques like responding with empathy and motivational interviewing. Coaches will also learn what constitutes reasonable accommodations and how to help students get them. And lastly, peer coach self-care is very important. Coaching can be quite demanding, and there are sure to be tough times as well as positive moments throughout the course of the program. And we want to lift everybody up, not bring anybody down, particularly if the coaches themselves are contending with their own mental health condition. Coaches will work closely with a supervisor who will be an important mentor for helping them consider their own needs in this way. We have found in talking with peer coaches on the ground and from prior phases of the study that the PASS manual can be a bit cumbersome, and we really wanted to act as a useful workbook. So for phase four, we designed it as a three-ring binder where pages with fill-in-the-blanks and more can be taken out and used. We also further simplified and condensed some of the language and the information into even more accessible single-page documents as tools and tip sheets so that they can act as quick reference guides. As you can see, there are a number of important coaching principles and ethics that guide the PASS program and the coaches, but there are really two major themes that stand out and really encapsulate all of them. On one hand, the PASS model truly emphasizes the individual and their strengths and virtues versus their mental health condition or their symptomatology. We are not our symptoms, and it's important that students be treated as robust and resilient individuals rather than a collection of distressing thoughts and symptoms. And it's important that they see themselves in this way as well, which speaks back to emotional agility and resiliency. On the other hand, however relationship-based our model should be, coaches must adhere to appropriate boundaries, and it must be understood that they are not the student's therapists. They are there to offer peer support and work alongside students to figure out ways of meeting their academic needs. Coaching supervisors will help the peer coaches best navigate this area. With that in mind, coaches will receive extensive training from a peer coach supervisor with a lot of experience in college mental health coaching, and they will receive ongoing training and supervision. The training will consist of both webinars and a two-day in-person training, which will total 12 hours. And there will be weekly one-hour group supervisions wherein coaches will practice skills from the peer coach manual and provide one another with mutual support. They will also be provided with learning opportunities around how to implement many of these integral aspects of the coaching model they're learning. For example, how to go about helping a student receive reasonable accommodations. And with that, I'll turn it over to Amanda, who will discuss some of the ways we're assessing impact and fidelity with the program. So thank you to Ian and Laura. I'm not sure how I'm going to be able to follow my amazing colleagues, but I'm going to try to do my best. And so I'm here to tell you a little bit about how we're assessing whether or not the peer coach model can be effective on campus and actually can help students succeed academically. And so what you're probably starting to figure out listening to Ian and Laura share some of this information is that our model is really focused on helping students with academic success. We feel like campuses have done a lot of work to help students manage their symptoms um, through counseling services and other mental health supports on campus, like advocacy groups. Um, but a lot of these campuses aren't focusing on how to help students learn what their mental health impacts academically and then how to improve those academic skills um, and get those coping skills figured out to improve success. So our model is really focused on the academic side and managing your mental health while being a student, which is a very unique path to walk. So in order to see if the PASS model is working, 
we developed a nice little logic model that outlines um, short-term and long-term outcomes that our team really felt were the most important for assessing um, academic success for students. So the short-term outcomes that we feel are most imperative for improving student success is the STEER competencies that Ian alluded to earlier. Um, so we're looking at each of those STEER competencies and have scales developed that students will be completing, which I'll talk about in a couple minutes, to really see how those competency areas are improving over time. And then on the long-term outcome level, we are looking at the basic ways that people define in the literature and in campus what they call quote quote academic success. So is their GPA improving? Do they have increased graduation rates? Are they staying in classes? Are they withdrawing early? What's their retention rate look like on campus? But then we're also tapping into whether or not these students are improving in areas that we feel are important to keep academic resiliency and grit going. And also just basic characteristics that we feel improve academic success and has been um, touted in some literature. So things like, are they increasing their general self-efficacy? Are they increasing their academic self-efficacy? Do they have increased self-determination skills as a result of working with their coach? Um, are they able to decrease their internalized stigma and access the services they need without fear of repercussion? And are they improving their relationships on campus with faculty and administrators and other students over time? We feel that campus relationships was a big conversation that we heard um, talking to students as an area they really wanted to see improvement. And in life, um, positive relationships have an impact on mental health and wellness in all areas. So how are we assessing these areas? We are looking at both impact and fidelity. So as Laura talked about a little earlier and Ian alluded to, we want to make sure that this program is working. So we are testing this model at BU currently and tested it with around a dozen students, as Laura mentioned, last year. But can we replicate this in the future at other campuses, and what would it look like to do that? So for our fidelity side of things, on the right-hand side of our slides, we are having our peer coaches submit weekly logs that track their activities with their students, how things are going, what are the activities or areas of need that students are talking um, about having most need in, what are they doing on the ground, how long is it taking, and pretty much like what's effective and what's ineffective. And then we're having our peer coach supervisor, who is a great guy on campus, Paul Churchia through BU, um, who is submitting weekly supervision logs. So he's telling us about how things are going as he's supervising the peer coaches and figuring out and problem solving with them how to best support their students. On the other side, Paul also has um, supervision from one of our co-eyes, Dory Hutchinson at BU. And so she's submitting weekly logs about what does it take to supervise the peer coach supervisor and support them in the implementation of this model on the ground. We're also conducting student and coach focus groups to really learn directly from the students who are participating in PASS and the coaches who are providing coaching every semester what things are looking like on the ground and what's working and what's not. And that's where we really rebuilt our PASS model in the manual um, and turned it into that three ring binder design that Ian showed you earlier, was as a result of talking to students and coaches about what worked last year when we implemented the model. Then on a monthly basis, we have coaches and students submit evaluations. The coaches evaluate themselves and how well they are doing working with their student and what areas students have the greatest need in. And then the students are evaluating the coaches and how effective and supportive they've been in their role. On the impact side, in order to assess those short and long-term outcomes with the students themselves, we're completing we're having students complete web surveys at three time points. At the baseline, when they enroll in PASS, at the end of the first academic semester they're enrolled, and at the end of the second academic semester. And so that's where we're assessing some of those outcomes like resiliency and improved self-efficacy and whether or not those skill sets are shifting. And then we're also collecting academic records like transcripts to see if GPA is improving over time and whether or not students are staying in courses and having improved retention rates. We're collecting that the following semester after their entire year enrolled in PASS. So we can see um, once they've completed an entire academic year of PASS coaching, whether or not they've had improved GPA or retention. So what are we doing now? Um, Ian alluded to this earlier, but currently we are actually testing this model for a second round in a pilot randomized control trial at Boston University. And this is happening through partnership with the Boston University Center for Psych Rehab, where we're currently recruiting 50 students to participate. 
And so 25 of those students will be randomized to receive PATH coaching, and then the other 25 will be randomized to receive enhanced services as usual. And so we want to keep them engaged in the study and learn about what it's like to receive typical services as usual, but we're also providing a one-on-one -on -one meeting with a resource specialist at the beginning of their enrollment in the study where they can review existing on-campus services and identify ones that might be most helpful for them. So that's where we are calling enhanced services as usual. So we wanted to close out our webinar by kind of just discussing a little bit about college mental health and the impact that mental health can have on college student success and point you to some other resources. We got a lot of really good questions from audience members about what they wanted to learn from this webinar. And I don't think we touched on all of those areas, but we feel like we have a lot of resources that might. So we wanted to point you to some of the tip sheets that the Transitions to Adulthood Center for Research has developed in recent years um, that are focused on college student success. So Dee mentioned that there's a handout attached to this presentation, and this will also be available on our website, but all of these resources are linked directly to the tip sheets, which are free to print, download, and access at any time. So the three we are pointing to is a tip sheet on accommodations for college students with mental health conditions on campus, um, another tip sheet about out-of-the-box accommodations, so how do you get those non-traditional accommodations and think creatively about managing your mental health on campus. And then talking about mental health rights on campus and how do you take a leave and manage financial success while being a student and financial aid and all the barriers that may happen when you are diagnosed with a mental health condition or managing mental health symptoms on campus. So in addition to our past study, we really believe in college mental health in our center. And these are just some of the products that we've developed to really help students be successful on campus. And if you are interested in PASS or know someone who might be, we put up our handy dandy little flyer here that we are using to advertise on the BU campus currently. Our hope is that eventually PASS will be in a full randomized control trial and we'll be testing with other universities. So if you are an academic representative and think this could be a good fit for your school, please reach out. Or if you are or know someone who is a BU student, please reach out to us. We put the contact information of our great interviewer, Maya, on the screen, and you can call, text, or email her to get more information about PATH. Um, so we really want to spread the word about this study, and we are actively recruiting for this phase of the work. So I wanted to just close it out by thanking everyone for participating. We definitely want to turn it over to Dee to facilitate a question and answer session. But before I do that, I want to thank our amazing team who has been working with us for the last five years to make this study a reality. So we partnered with Dory Hutchinson and Paul Churchia and many other amazing um, staff and faculty at Boston University. So shout out to them for helping us make PASS a reality and actually test the PASS model on their campus. Um, we also partnered with Mary Huber and Heather Rando, who are great staff uh, faculty members at Wright State University, who created that RAISE model that we talked about earlier to help us develop this model and keep it running and really modify it for students with mental health conditions. And then internally, our PI on this study, Marianne Davis, has been instrumental in really getting this up and running and following it through through these last four or five years of work. And our internal team, my amazing co-presenters, Ian and Laura, um, really keep this study running day to day. Um, myself, I'm Amanda, and I'm the project director on this study, so we all work so closely together to keep this going, as well as our amazing interviewers out there working with our team at Boston University, Maya, Danielle, um, and David. So I did want to do a shout out to everyone who's worked tirelessly to make this PATH model work for students on campus. With that, Dee, I think we can turn it over to you and really open it up for questions. We are really good on time. So we have around 20 minutes to answer questions. Um, we do have some questions that were pre-submitted that we can touch on, but first I wanted to see, Dee, if we had any live questions that we want to start with. Hi, Amanda. Thank you guys so much for that really exciting presentation. That sounds like an awesome project that will hopefully really help students uh, we have one question that's come in, and hopefully this will break the ice and other folks will uh, start typing in there. Uh, one person was wondering, um, will we be making this program available to other colleges? Um, and if so, is there a cost associated? And I know this is still a kind of 
early phase, so, but I wondered if what the thoughts were on expanding it eventually. Yes, that is a great question. So our hope right now for the academic year, we're only testing this model at Boston University because they partnered with us to conduct the research. Our hope is to submit for future funding for a full randomized controlled trial where we would partner with multiple universities to test the PASS model. Um, there is currently no cost to our students who participate, and that is the aim is to keep it that way, where this model would be free to any student who is interested. Um, we do pay our peer coaches uh, hourly rates so they can provide peer coaching, so they're hired as university students. So there is a, a grant funding cost associated with some of these activities, but that's kind of part of the project implementation and fidelity that we're working out, is how do we fund a PASS model without charging students. And so if you are interested in talking to us further about implementing the model on your campus, I have Laura, myself, and Ian's email addresses up on the screen. Do not hesitate to reach out to us. We are really invested in moving this forward on other university campuses and would be happy to discuss what that could look like for your school. So thank you for submitting that question. And please submit some more questions. We're happy to talk about college mental health in general. I know we touched on our model, but we have worked with other studies about college mental health and supported education. So if you have broader questions, we're happy to think about those with you as well. So uh, someone asked, how long are the sessions with the coach typically? Sure, so coaching sessions, Traditionally, from what we've seen on the ground testing this model last year, students are meeting one-on-one -on -one with their coach on campus from anywhere to 30 minutes to an hour and a half. And then in additional um, time, our coaches are paid for up to five hours of work per week with per student they serve. So that could include email, Skyping, texting, creating materials. One student offline worked with their coach to develop an actual, like, outline calendar and then they send it to them and they help them follow through with that. So the in-person sessions go usually no longer than an hour and a half, but we don't minimize students' ability to meet with their coach more than once. So sometimes during the semester, like pre-midterms or finals, coaches were meeting with their students for an hour twice a week to provide more intensive support. But on average, we're asking coaches to provide up to five hours per week. Okay. Uh, someone was, and I'll explain this, the uh, resources that Amanda mentioned, the three tip sheets, are all available on the Transitions ACR's website, which is www.umassmed.edu backslash Transitions ACR. Uh, there's a publications tab there that will bring you to where they are. Uh, and if you need copies, feel free to email me or any of the presenters and we can send you the link directly or uh, we can send you hard copies if you need hard copies. Uh, someone was wondering, um, is the PASS manual available or is that just study materials? Good question. So we're not distributing the PASS manual broadly just yet because we're still refining it based on this phase of work currently happening at BU. Our hope ultimately is to partner with other universities who would use the PASS manual. Um, if you are interested in thinking through how to implement something similar at your campus though, we'd ha be happy to discuss sharing some pieces of it or thinking about particular tools from the model that might be helpful. So definitely reach out if that's something you're interested in doing. And ultimately we hope eventually the model would be available. Thank you. Um, let's see. So someone was wondering, what is the counseling center's response, and are they involved in supporting this in the future? Good question. So we've had mixed responses from counseling centers across multiple universities when talking about the PASS model. Um, I think some counseling centers really see the benefit to providing a coach on campus um, for many of the reasons that Laura discussed, the Counseling Center and also the Disability Services Centers are really overloaded. So having a student on campus that is acting as a coach where they can help provide a warm handoff to these services that students need um, and help connect them with resources on campus, that might be helpful and kind of mitigate 
um, that that need to walk through some of these services and learn those advocacy skills has been helpful. Um, so I think that one of the areas where the counseling services have mentioned concern before is liability and the role of a student providing services on campus. But like I had mentioned earlier, and I want to stress again, the service is not to provide support for mental health symptoms, but instead to provide academic support and success. So students who are receiving coaching are often also receiving support from the counseling services. This isn't a replacement, it's kind of like an added benefit. And I think Laura wanted to add something to that. I was just gonna add our current involvement with counseling centers on campus. So we're currently working on the Boston University campus. So our relationship with their center is just asking them to keep in mind referring students to the past program if they feel that they could benefit from it. Um, so we're definitely in contact with them in terms of referrals and working together to support a student's various needs. As Amanda said, Counseling Center is probably more oriented towards symptom management and we're more on the academic support uh, side of things and supporting students' overall wellness. Yeah, and I think a big concern for us is that the, these campus services, due to confidentiality reasons and just being overburdened and having a huge influx of student need, often don't have the ability to communicate as effectively across services as they would like. So our hope is that a coach can help facilitate that process and connect students with these services and serve as a liaison between some of these services to help students understand what is available, how to access, and how to advocate for these needs. So we hope that schools would see this as an added bonus for students, and our goal is definitely not to replace any of the existing services. Great question. Okay, this is more of a, a comment for possibly, you know, expanding past if you get to do a larger RCT. Uh, well, do you think you'll be able to try to do this on a community college rather than a four-year uh, university or college? I love that question because we talk about that all the time. Um, so, yes, we would love that. And we really feel that there's a huge benefit to providing something like PASS on community college campuses and would be really interested in thinking about that as part of our randomized control trial. When Laura discussed where we conducted our qualitative interviews, we heavily thought about conducting qualitative interviews at a community college. We ended up going with the three universities we chose because we wanted to represent students who are engaging in private school students who are engaging in public school and students who are primarily commuters, which is what UMass Boston brought to the table for the primary commuter population. And we felt like because of those three descriptions or the experiences of those students would vary so greatly from community college students and the fact that they're in a completely different degree field, that it didn't make sense to add them in at that point. But for an RCT, that would be a lovely idea and we would definitely be open to thinking about how to make that work. Yeah, we're enthusiastically a yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, so someone was wondering, uh, and I believe this isn't talking about the, the peer coaches, um, are they, the older students, they're taking classes at the same time as they're doing this, yes? Yes, they are actively enrolled, and all of the students who are coaches are actually full-time uh, undergraduate upperclassmen students at BU. So they're either juniors or seniors enrolled in full-time courses. Yeah, and I think that that's something that we're very mindful of in implementing PASS. For example, at stressful times of the semester, such as midterms or finals, not only are their students maybe looking for more support, but the peer coaches themselves are under an increased level of stress. So that's something that there's active conversations about in weekly supervision with the peer coach supervisor, and that's where peer coach self-care comes into play. So we do have an ongoing dialogue about managing the role of peer coach while also being a full-time undergraduate student. And when we created this model, we talked to um, college students about a reasonable job, campus job, that what hours that would look like. And they were telling us that their primary on-campus jobs were around five to 10 hours per week. 
which is why we tried to structure the coaching model for up to five hours of support per student that you serve. And so some coaches are serving one student, some coaches are serving more than one, depending on their capacity and availability. And like Laura said, we really stress that part of the um, peer coaching manual has a whole module on peer coaching self-care because they are students themselves uh, managing this whole academic environment at the same time as providing support to others who are doing the same. Great, and that answered another question which was about how many students does each coach have and it sounds like it varies on their, their schedule. Um, yeah, I typically try to keep it to two students at max because we feel like we don't want to stretch our coaches too thin and we want them to really be able to focus. So for example, for this academic year we have 50 students, 25 of which will be randomized to receive coaching. So currently we have hired, I think, 13 coaches, knowing that um, they'll re most of them will receive two students to support, but no more. Awesome. Um, so have you, what is the buy-in like for the faculty staff uh, at BU or, um, or, you know, where you're doing this, this study? Is it good or how is it going? So that's an interesting question. I think that people who are here about it are very enthusiastic. We have faculty, administrators, um, people working in the athletic department all over campus sharing our flyers with students. And once they hear about the program, they seem to really find the value in it and share it with a lot of their students. Um, we are still building that capacity for how do we better advertise this program across the university. A school like BU has multiple different campuses with different focus, so it's hard for us to really educate everyone. So we are in the process of creating a faculty um, kind of training and advertisement. And the training would be on mental health and supports and how do you support students with mental health, but also how do you link them to the past model. So we're trying to create resources for faculty while also simultaneously educating them about the model. But so far, we've heard pretty positive things from those who have been acquainted with the model. And we have our amazing supports, Paul and Dory, knocking on doors on campus, attending National Depression Screening Day to tell students and faculty and staff about this program, going into first year orientation classes to advertise. So we're doing a lot of work on the ground to really showcase this model and get feedback and buy-in from these campus uh, administrators and staff. Nice. Um, so another person, uh, could you just clarify about whether the coaches have lived experience with mental health conditions or not? Is that a requirement to be a coach? That's an excellent question. Uh, lived experience with a mental health condition is not a requirement for the position, um, but it is a preferred qualification. We really value that lived experience that uh, undergraduates can bring to the table in their role as peer coaches. It was really interesting. Um, we put out the flyer advertising the peer coach position last year, and uh, like all of the peer coaches we ended up hiring, except for maybe one, did identify as having lived experience. So it's not a requirement, but um, it's very common, and we do state on our position description that you know, we, we very much value lived experience if a peer coach does bring that to, to the table. And as part of our um, past training and manual, we talk about how to strategically share your lived experience as a coach and when to bring it into coaching and how do you do that in a way that facilitates support and academic success. So, for example, having a coach share how they navigated getting an accommodation or how they advocated for extended time on a a test when they were struggling with their mental health with a professor. And by sharing those own personal experiences, kind of what got them through and what worked and what didn't is a really benefit in our eyes. But we do provide training on that, is disclosing your mental health if you are a coach who has lived experience and like kind of what that looks like on the ground. So kind of as a follow-up to that, do the students who are getting coached to has it had a negative impact or any impact at all if they're um, paired with a coach that doesn't have lived experience? 
That's a good question. We're not actually testing for that outright, so I don't think we can say based on any data whether it's having a negative impact. Um, we have talked about in the future in our, our larger randomized control trial comparing potentially having lived experience as a required qualification versus coaches who don't, and if there is any impact. For now, I would say coaches with and without lived experience have provided amazing support depending on the need. We didn't mention that we have a peer coach matching form that both the students and the coaches fill out to better assess characteristics and interests um, and see if we can match them based on interests um, about campus activities or interest in how do you um, think about your academic success in areas of need versus um, things like hobbies, um, trying to think of other areas. But that's kind of our way of assessing um, student interest and how to kind of pair that with what our coaches bring to the table. But we haven't yet assessed directly the lived experience factor and if it's had an impact negatively or positively. Oh, that's, that's really cool about that matching form. Um, yeah, that's we didn't actually have that last year and then our coaches told us it would have been helpful um, to know a little bit more about their students' interest and to be able to kind of advocate for areas they felt like they had heightened skills and on the same end for the students, areas where they wanted more support um, or interest like their major um, that mm -hmm. they would like to align with their coach. And so we actually created that and are testing that this semester based on that feedback, which was really helpful. Cool. So you addressed this briefly, but I would like to hear more about why you decided to focus specifically on academic success rather than dealing with the student's mental health or teaching them stress relief techniques, et cetera, obviously at the level that a peer coach could do, not a professional. Sure, so I think I'll touch on that a little bit. So our coaches do work on things like coping skills and stress techniques, so they don't take mental health out of the equation, but what they're focusing on is how does your mental health impact your academic success and what academically based tools can you use or bring into your toolbox to improve your academic functioning. From what we see out in the communities and in the U.S. in general, there's a lot of mental health treatment and symptom management techniques, but there aren't a lot of structured um, interventions that support students translating how their symptoms impact their academics. And so for college students, they know they may know how to manage their mental health and what helps, like medication or coping skills, but they don't know how to then translate that to what is it going to look like on the ground for my academics. So if I have to take in a leave of absence, how is that going to impact me in school? If I have stress taking or test taking anxiety, how do I manage that in the, the world as a student? And so our area, we what we found was the area of need that students and faculty and staff mentioned was this academically based intervention that looks at both mental health and academics but isn't really symptom management based. And I think Laura wanted to add something. I just kind of throw out there, I think based on our experience um, working on supporting young adults with mental health conditions in terms of school and work, um, we often see, you know, symptoms oftentimes with a chronic mental health condition, they come and go and they're not necessarily ever going to go away. Um, and that's okay. And so we're all about how to um, support students be successful while managing the symptoms. So it's not so much symptom management, but it's like academic tools to use when you do have symptoms, if that makes sense. Yeah, so it's kind of looking at the recovery process as a marathon and not a sprint, and how do you build tools in to manage that mental health recovery that can keep your academic success in the midst of managing symptoms on campus. So I hope that answers that question. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it is 12.01, so unfortunately we have to end the webinar at this time. For those of you who we couldn't get to your questions, feel free to email me and I will forward it on to the presenters in the hopes that they may be able to answer it. Uh, my email address is deirdre.logan at umassmed.edu. I just want to do a shout out that you can uh, sign up
for our listserv. Uh, you'll get emails about exciting new products, um, reminder, you know, new webinars, all of that. You can join by texting Transitions ACR to 22, I think that's 828. <laughs> or uh, you can visit our website at umassmed.edu backslash transitions ACR and you can sign up for our list of there. You can see all of our really great products that um, you can download uh, much more than just the three tip sheets we talked about. And there's also uh, information about this project that's available there as well. Uh, so thank you everyone so much. Thank you Amanda, Ian, and Laura. That was awesome. Uh, have a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.